CCJ's 1044 is brought to you by Chevron Dello Heavy Duty Diesel Engine Oil. Now there's even more reasons to choose Dello. The amount of cross-border freight between the U.S. and Canada and the U.S. and Mexico is on the rise. What's driving that trend? You're watching CCJ's 1044, a weekly webisode that brings you the latest trucking industry news and updates from the editors of CCJ. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications so you'll never miss an installment of 1044. Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm Jason Cannon and my co-host is always on the other side is Matt Cole. According to the latest report from the Bureau of Transportation Statistics, total transborder freight in North America was up about 7.5% in February over the same month a year ago. That was driven by a 4.4% increase in freight between the U.S. and Canada and a 10.6% increase between U.S. and Mexico. Of the $128.9 billion of transborder freight moved in February across all modes, trucking moved by far the largest portion of that, $83.4 billion. Ryan Williams, Vice President of Solutions and Head of Cross-Border at Coyote Logistics, joins us this week to talk about what his company is seeing and how it's handling the influx of cross-border freight. So Coyote, I think traditionally is probably known more as a, as a U.S.-based um, 3PL and brokerage. Um, my background is maybe a little bit different in that sense, where um, you know I was, I was heavily involved in the UPS side of things pre and post acquisition. I actually moved over to Europe and was there running our operations for three years. I've been back in the U.S. and, and focusing on cross-border now for three years, cross-border specifically for about a year. But in terms of kind of our background, particularly on the southern border, we've had an office and a team set up in Guadalajara since 2016, which in terms of kind of just experience and, and a differentiator on our side, the, the expertise there and, and the fact that we've been there as long as we have is, is certainly something that we leverage. A lot of the people that we still have on the team, the team's right around 150 people now, have been around for, you know, five plus years. So really since that inception, which is, is obviously great in terms of, you know, how we can leverage that and what the experience looks like there. But yeah, in terms of kind of the, the freight that we move and what our focus is, you know, on both borders, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty balanced on the northern border in terms of what we look at, both northbound and southbound. Intra-Canada is a fairly small piece that we're looking to grow. But in terms of that balance, that's something that's, that's a little bit more manageable on the north side. In terms of the southern border, you know, things still do and probably will continue to skew heavier northbound. If you look at kind of the import-export data, that's obviously growing from an import standpoint. Given, I think, a lot of the news that people are familiar with, with you know Mexico now being the U.S.'s largest trade partner. But in terms of kind of how that continues to evolve, I think it's it's something where you know obviously people are bullish on what that looks like in the future, and I think how you kind of manage that from both a, a shipper and carrier standpoint is something that that I think is still evolving, and people are getting their feet under them in terms of what that looks like. So I think what we offer there is just certainly you know consultative components that can help with that, but also you know that background and experience from a from a capacity standpoint, from a you know, shipper knowledge standpoint that um, you know, we've just been around as long as we have been in that market. Ryan says there was a shift in how a lot of cross-border freight was handled during the COVID pandemic that shippers have preferred to stick around. Nearshoring is that, that big buzzword that I think everybody's familiar with at this point. I think there's an article almost every day where you, you see that pop up, right? So I think in terms of what we're seeing you know, and how that's impacted things, particularly since, since COVID, you know, I think a lot has changed because of that, you know, in terms of how, you know, companies are managing their freight and how carriers are reacting accordingly. I think we've seen a lot more shippers interested in carriers that can provide that through trailer door-to-door -door service that was maybe more conducive to, you know, the marketplace during COVID, but also is, is maybe a, you know, less touch than, you know, a, a transload would be at the border. I think in terms of the freight flows themselves, they're obviously changing and will continue to change as, you know, manufacturing and factory openings continue to push closer to the border. You're seeing that length of haul decrease. You're seeing the, you know, the lanes that you're really focusing on changing. And I think that's something that'll continue to kind of evolve as we go here. So I think it's, it's something that's worth keeping a pulse on kind of current state, but also I do kind of plan future state. Really, what does that look like? What are those ports of entry you're focused on? What are the lanes going to look like that may change from shippers that you're working with on a consistent basis as time goes on? So I really think that kind of collaborative approach across, you know, both parties, you know, and, and the necessity of oftentimes having somebody in the middle coordinating a lot of that, particularly from a border perspective, is, is going to be even more important than it has been. As Ryan mentioned, Mexico has become the United States' biggest trade partner. 
Ryan explains why that's happened and what he sees going forward after a quick word from 1044 sponsor, Chevron Lubricants. These past few years have been less than easy. We've encountered challenges we never imagined we'd ever have to deal with. From makeshift home offices and video meetings to global supply chain uncertainty, price instability, market disruptions, and everything in between. Delivering the level of services and products our customers had come to expect was difficult for all of us. We can't change what's behind us, but we can definitely learn from it. We can adapt, evolve, and take steps to reset our thinking, adapt our strategies, and restore your trust in us to better meet your needs now and in the future. That change begins today. Today we break with convention and introduce a rebalanced line of Dello heavy duty engine oils. We've reduced our product line from four categories to two. Consolidated and simplified, this lineup removes complexity from the manufacturing processes, enhancing price stability and supply chain reliability so you can trust you will have the premium products you need to keep your business always moving forward. Our Break with Convention optimizes the Dello lineup to allow you to provide your customers with the best synthetic blend and synthetic heavy-duty engine oils in the market, fully available at prices you can rely on. It's your assurance that you'll be well positioned to be their trusted source for proven engine protection that keeps equipment on the job, giving your customers even more reasons to choose Dello. If you look at the segmentation of, of you know companies that are moving into Mexico or expanding their operations, it's very automotive heavy. It's very IT heavy, electronics heavy. You know, it's a lot of those companies that did look at moving their origin points in Asia and manufacturing in Asia and then really how they get their freight back into the U.S. So, you know, I think in terms of, of the growth component there, a lot of that's going to continue to be driven by those, those segments. And there's obviously specialization tied into those segments and how a lot of those customers want their freight move. So in terms of kind of what you look at from a capacity allocation standpoint, you have to be conscious of that specialization. There's there's a lot more variables that go into, particularly the, the southern border and the freight moving into the U.S. Um, in that regard. So I think we're continuing to see kind of new requirements that pop up in accordance with a lot of that freight. So I think just being on top of that, you know, and also a lot of the governmental regulations that are continuing to change and evolve as time goes on um, only becomes more important. So, you know, in general, you know, a lot of that it ties back into, I think, the, the the inbound component and, you know, whether it's raw materials or finished product. I think we saw two of the West Coast ports in, in Mexico as the only two in North America that grew in 2023 and, and will continue to do so. So, you know, what does the infrastructure and capacity look like for, you know, drayage? What does it look like in terms of getting, you know, freight into those larger hubs within Mexico? And you kind of think about that triangle between Mexico City, Monterey and Guadalajara, You know, that's where a lot of that capacity is aggregated. So you have a lot of the drainage companies that are pulling freight from those ports into those areas or directly to the border. You know, what does that look like a year from now? What does that look like five years from now? Likely completely different than it does today. So, uh, again, it's kind of keeping a pulse on that and what that looks like and ultimately how that fits into your planning from a shipper perspective or from a carrier perspective. With more freight coming across the border, more opportunities are available for U.S. based carriers that are looking to expand their operations. You know, a lot more of those southern border based carriers that we've worked with traditionally are now, you know, a lot more interested in expanding their operations into Mexico because it does link up so well. And, you know, especially from that transload perspective with northbound freight, there is such heavy reliance on rates in the U.S. and that piece from the border inland that, you know, really having kind of that holistic view on things is 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 really important, you know, for them, for us as well, and, and ultimately for the shipper base. So I think in terms of what we've seen there is just, you know, obviously increased interest in expanding that and what that looks like outside of just the U.S. piece that maybe we were, you know, more heavily focused on in the past. Now it's really just how can we kind of get that A to Z view of what the shipment is doing or what the product is doing, you know, from its origin point, whether that's in Asia or otherwise, into Mexico, into the U.S. You know, I think there's variable ways of approaching that, maybe more so than there had been in the past you know, both in terms of the truckload piece and then, you know, increased intermodal offerings now, you know, spanning through the U.S. and into Canada. There's a lot more options out there. And I think, you know, leveraging that optionality is something that's that's good for, for everybody. 
um, and just making sure that, you know, obviously there's an option on the table that works best for that specific load, that specific freight, whatever it may be. I think the main thing right now that, that especially this year and, and really as of April 1 that's come into play is the additional layer of the, the complemental card to Porte, which is, you know, for, for U.S. carriers, very similar to a kind of an expanded and, and more detailed BOL. So the necessity of having those for shipments crossing is, is becoming significantly more important than it was previously. You know, carriers are very conscious with the fines that are associated with that if that's not provided by a shipper. So really the first portion of this year has been working through that with our shipper and carrier base just to make sure there's as much consistency and education as possible tied into that. There definitely were variable approaches in terms of, you know, what shippers were doing to comply with that, at least to start the year. But with that becoming, you know, a lot more rigid as, as time goes on here and really as of, of April 1, I think in terms of what that looks like for carriers, it's, it's just something to be conscious of and something that I think we're particularly conscious of making sure everybody on our end is aware of and, and you know, kind of who is responsible for what piece is there. Looking to the north, Ryan says U.S. Canada freight has been stable in recent times. It's been pretty stable. Um, I think we saw, especially last year, it was a it was a, a really stable year, kind of coming out of twenty two, and we saw kind of things, I, I guess, kind of progress in a manner that was pretty reflective of the U.S. market. But in terms of kind of what that looks like, at least to start this year, you know, the import piece is down about three percent. The export piece is is a little bit more. But really, for last year, it was it was roughly flat, a bit up in terms of imports. In terms of what we see there, you know, it's really kind of just been the status quo. I think, you know, we do see some West Coast influence from a nearshoring standpoint and, and, you know, shippers conscious of bringing stuff into, you know, the Port of Vancouver or whatever it may be on that side of things. But in terms of kind of the evolution of what that looks like, it's it's definitely different than the Southern border. I think, you know, for us, it's really been focusing on expanding, you know, maybe our LTL offerings or final mile offerings where we can on top of the truckload piece that again, we've had and moved for, you know, a decade plus now since really probably the inception of, of Coyote. So, you know, I think that one's, you know, a little bit more projectable in terms of kind of how, you know, again, you you procure and how you kind of allocate capacity to the freight that you have available. So, you know, I, I, I do think, you know, it's something that will always continue to evolve to always be components that influence that. I think there you see, you know, a lot of not necessarily natural disasters, but weather events that impact things. There, there's more in that sense that I think is is on the table on a consistent basis than than maybe we see in Mexico, but it's definitely been a more stable environment, of, you know, especially over the past 12, 12 or so months here. That's it for this week's 1044. You can read more on ccjdigital.com. While you're there, sign up for our newsletter and stay up to date on the latest in trucking industry news and trends. If you have any questions or feedback, please let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications so you can catch us again next week. 